Well, that leads us very neatly onto the issue of Hungary. How has a country that was occupied by both Nazis and communists for a large part of the 20th century now emerged as a beacon of conservatism? I think the, I think the issue of border control might be prominent in your answer, Josh. Yep. Yeah. So, look, I've been to Hungary now two years in a row. I've, I've had uh, the distinct pleasure of meeting uh, the prime minister, Viktor Orban, and the president, actually, Katalin Novak, uh, on both of those trips. So two years in a row now. So, uh, you know, I, I really have seen kind of the Hungarian model up close and personal. And I think what you said about kind of their occupation, I, I mean, so that part of Europe, right, it's not just Hungary, Poland, that entire part of Europe has effectively been conquered by empires for virtually a thousand years. And, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a miracle that it, when it comes to Hungary in particular, that this kind of sense of Hungarian national identity, of, of their ethnicity, their language, their customs, their traits, it's kind of a miracle that it still exists, given all the totalitarian empires that have conquered that relatively small plot of land there in the heart of Central Europe. So fast forward, and after the Cold War, I mean, when, when, when Hungary kind of emerges as an independent power, they finally are independent. They are not kind of subject to kind of a, a imperial rule. And yeah, they want to kind of cling very steadfastly to their sense of national identity. And the government there, uh, Orban came to power, I think roughly 2010, 2011 or so. They have done a really, really good job at politically appealing to the Hungarian people's sense of national well-being. And their kind of public policy portfolio has a lot of interesting aspects to it. One, as you as you intimated, is that they, they do control their borders. So going back to when Angela Merkel of Germany kind of took in a million plus Syrian refugees in 2015, Hungary tried its best to close its border. Kind of, it kind of went over the top of the European Union, which was encouraging all the all the countries in the, in the EU to take in effectively unlimited refugees. Hungary has built a partial border wall with Serbia on its southern border, much to the chagrin, I think, of the EU and kind of all the usual suspects in Brussels and Turtle Bay in New York City. And also, when it comes to kind of this Hungarian nationalism sense of, of, of Hungarian peoplehood, probably the number one thing that the government has done is – they have really, really put a heavy-handed emphasis on the nuclear family, and they have really kind of shaped their entire tax code, property rights, individual tax rates, marriage, all of it to effectively reward and incentivize child rearing and protect protect children also from kind of the excesses of the transgenderism and modern gender ideology. So it really has been an interesting experiment to watch unfold. It's a small country, obviously, so it's not necessarily – always going to be translatable to larger countries like Australia or the U.S., but I, I am of the opinion that there are concrete lessons to be learned there, and I'm, I was very happy to be back there last week. Are they generally, are they generally happier than people in, you know, in people like the U.S. and Australia? I mean, surely it depends who you ask, right? I mean, you know, Hungary's GDP per capita is is not as high as as the U.S. or Australia. It's probably not as high as, uh, you know, as Germany or or the U.K. or some of the, some of the greater kind of economic powers in the U.S. But I mean, it's doing it. It's doing a heck of a lot better. And look, I mean, if there's if there's one rate, you know, if there's one metric that I think a lot of people would kind of cite as one evidence of whether people are happy. It's really the fertility rate, right? Because people are not going to have children if they're pessimistic about the future of the country, and they will have children if they're optimistic, if they're cheery, if they're hopeful. And you know, Hungary's fertility rate is still, I believe, below. Uh, it's still below the replacement rate of 2.1, but it has made substantial improvements over the past decade or so. It's kind of shot up from roughly 1.2, 1.3 to around 1.7, 1.8. I can't remember the exact numbers here. But they've had a roughly 50 percent, 40 to 50 percent improvement, which is which is no small thing. And, you know, I think that fact alone kind of kind of, kind of says it. And, you know, one other interesting thing so that I like, that I like to keep tabs on is actually I, I mean, you know, countries like Hungary and Poland, you, you can't help but think about, about anti-Semitism. Right. And traditionally, anti-Semitism in some countries tend to flare up when, when civilizations are, are, are very dire, right? I mean, when, 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 when things are going to hell, who do you turn to? You know, I mean, historically speaking, many, all too many countries turn to their Jewish population. It's worth noting that actually, according to a poll that I saw last year, Hungary had the second lowest rate of anti-Semitism of any country in Europe. I think Italy was actually number one. So, you know, that's not a perfect metric, but it, it, is, it is usually a proxy for a civilization that is doing well, because, again, civilizations that are not doing well tend to blame their, their Jews for all their problems.